Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Andy Berg, and I'm the executive editor of Athletic Business. Thank you for joining today's webinar, Aquatics and Coming Back After COVID. Are you ready? Um, during this webinar, you'll learn about how innovation in your pool filter room can improve the health of your water and air quality while creating uh, cost-saving sustainable solutions. We will discuss strategies on how to ensure your lifeguards, members, students, and guests breathe easily in your facility. Lastly, we, we will review tips on reopening your pool facilities. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to enter them into the questions tab and we'll get to them during a Q&A at the end of the session. Without further ado, I'd like you to introduce you to today's speaker, Scott Highland of Neptune Benson. Scott, take it away. Great, thank you very much, Andy. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as Andy said, my name is Scott Highland. I'm with uh, Neptune Benson. Actually, Saturday will be my 21st anniversary here. So needless to say, I, I got some experience and uh, uh, an extreme passion for what we do uh, for the industry. Um, so I hope you guys come with questions at the end here. You know, they're anonymous. Feel free to ask anything that you might be facing and, and hopefully I can, uh, can help you out. Um, you know, these, these webinars, it's not my first during this pandemic and I'm sure it's not the last, but talk about an awkward situation. I'm sitting here basically practicing in front of a mirror, right? I can't see anybody. So I thought I would start with a couple quick jokes to break the ice. And these are coming from my uh my youngest son his name's Ryder he's 8 uh he's he's our eighth child so i wanted to name him Ocho uh but my wife won that battle and his name's Ryder um uh, Ryder Scott so first joke what do you call a dog with no legs doesn't matter he ain't coming and Ryder emphasizes on the word ain't <laughs> another good one is uh what's red and bad for your teeth you think, well, fireballs, gumballs, jelly beans, a brick. So with that, let's get started. Hopefully today I can offer you guys some helpful tips. And whether you've been open during this pandemic, maybe just on a, a reduced scale, or maybe you had to completely shut down and you're ready to start your system up after a year. We're also going to go over some preventative maintenance tips and focus on some safe and sustainable solutions that are av available today in the market. So first we'll start with some tips and preventive maintenance. The first thing I'm gonna recommend and like to point out is that you have, that you know your system in short. You have a schematic. A schematic's like this picture in the, the lower left. It's just a drawing of your system, probably put together before the facility, or certainly put together before the facility was built. It's a great reference just to see where things are throughout the loop. Uh, secondly, label your valves and your piping. You can see this mechanical room on the right, pretty complex, multiple systems, but they can look right there and say, oh wow, look at that, that's the UV for the competition pool. You know, they don't have to go tracing wires. Um, have your O&M manuals, make sure you have record of them. They should ship with every product that you received and these O&M man manuals likely have preventive maintenance procedures and tips included within them. Um, most importantly, maintain your records. Keep records. You know, every day, go into your mechanical room, record your pressure readings, everything. This is, if you review this data regularly, you're likely going to see that something bad is about to occur. Uh, and that's what it really all, all boils down to, is being proactive and prepared so that it doesn't culminate into uh, a substantial issue. So today, I really wanna focus just on recirculation. I consider myself an expert in, fil in filtration, uh, turbidity reduction. I'm not gonna go over chemical side too much, two distinct aspects of maintaining a proper pool, chemistry, disinfection, and filtration turbidity reduction. So we're gonna uh, focus on the filtration, uh, but I am gonna start at the mechanical room at that surge tank. This is the equilibrium between your swimming pool and your mechanical system. Uh, there's different variations of surge tanks. Now, admittedly, many people on the call probably don't have a surge tank or a balance tank. They might have direct suction from their pump, uh, self-priming pumps, et cetera. Uh, however, for those, you might have an open top, which we see at the bottom here, or you might, and these could be in the deck right next to the pool, or they could be within the mechanical room. 
Um, a second type is an atmospheric tank. That could be a steel tank or a fiberglass tank. Um, you can see the vent at the top there. So it's atmospheric. It's not a pressurized tank. That vent is going up above the water level of your pool. So when you shut the pump down, the water can equalize. Um, for example, you don't want an open top surge tank in the basement. You know, when that pump shuts down, the whole pool is going to end up in your basement, obviously. Um, these, you know, so what goes into the, the surge tank? You know, you've got your gutters jump, dumping into it. You've got your main drain line coming into it. And you've got your pump suction coming out of it. And one first tip I could offer there is where you see three down there at the bottom in the upper right on the pump suction, an anti-vortex plate. This is just a PVC plate that goes around the bottom of the pump suction and it prevents vortexing, um, you know, creating from that suction. So those are relatively inexpensive, 100 bucks. Uh, but if you don't have one, you might, and you have air issues, you know, that air uh, anti vortex plate might resolve most, if not all, of your issues. Uh, these balance tanks, they do require regular inspection. You know, it's the first line of defense, swim caps, anything else that gets in there is going to get into this balance tank. So let's make sure they're clean. Um, they often have remote valve extensions. Uh, you can see the, the one in the bottom open top in the upper left, um, just to the right of the grate there. Uh, on that main drain line, they've got an isolation with a, with a valve extension. You know, we don't open and close these valves very frequently. So do open and close them relatively frequently, you know, on a monthly basis or whatever to make sure they don't seize up. Um, you know, if you don't use it, you know, it may not, may not work when you do need it. Uh, and most importantly, be careful uh, because a lot of these surge tanks could be considered confined space. After that surge tank, that pump suction is drawing that water uh, through a hair and lint strainer. It's the first line of defense if we didn't remove it from the surge tank initially. Uh, the hair and lint strainer is going to prevent the larger debris from bypass or getting through and um, interrupting the uh, pump impeller, destroying the impeller of your pump. A clog strainer substantially reduces the pump performance and flow. So if you've got a dirty strainer, you're going to have difficulty maintaining your flow. So they should be checked and potentially cleaned on a daily basis. I would note for anybody that might have an outdoor pool uh, that might have landscaping issues that you find that you're changing your hair and lint strainers frequently, you might want to consider a strainer like in the lower right-hand corner there, uh, a pro strainer uh, that has 300 to 400 times the open area of a traditional hair and lint strainer. Uh, so it will extend the time from having to, um, to clean, and plus the low center line on it um, does increase the performance of the pump. So there are some nice features of that style, and it might be of interest of anybody that has to, you know, frequently change their hair and lint pots. Um, as far as preventative maintenance, you know, those spare baskets, the baskets that you're removing, you know, some people bang them on the ground, some people put a torch to them, you know, all different ways of removing that hair and lint. Um, you know, so inspect those welds, make sure those baskets are in good condition. Uh, lid gasket, have spare gaskets on hand. You know, you never know when they're gonna go out and it would be unfortunate to be shut down because we're waiting on a, you know, on a gasket. Um, hold down knobs, maybe replacement knobs are needed. Um, you know, inspect your lid, um, you know, that clear acry acrylic lid on the upper right hand side there. You know, if you start to see stress cracks or anything, you know, address them, replace it before it becomes a catastrophic failure. The pump, the heart of the system, we got to keep it ticking. Without the pump, we're not maintaining flow. Without, if we're not maintaining flow, then, you know, we're not turning that pool over to the design rate uh, that, it, that it's intended to be. Uh, and it further, you know, affects chemical distribution, everything down line. Uh, so we got to make sure that pump's running. Um, Coming out of this pandemic, if you've been shut down, if this pump's been sitting dry, then you're probably going to need to, or, or likely going to need to replace the seals on that pump. And if that pump's not epoxy coated, uh, then it's you know the water that was in it is likely oxidized, and you know when you restart that pump, you might get a burst of uh, you know brownish water back, but you know it should go away. Um, ensure the pumps have influent and effluent pe pressure gauges. Um, you know you want to confirm the flow with the pump. You know, we, we rely too much on flow meters 
flow meters say whatever we want them to say. So we really want to do the calculation off of the pump and referring to the pump curve. And that's a further conversation that I'd be happy to have a conversation with people if they're interested or, or unaware how to do it. But you're reading the pressure on the effluent side of the pump. You're reading if there's any vacuum on the, on the influent side of the pump. You're con converting that PSI times 2.31, which is feet ahead. And you're, um, you know, cross-referencing it with your curve to ensure that that pump is in fact flowing what it's designed to do. And that kind of parlays into variable frequency drives. And I believe the most important piece of equipment in the mechanical room almost, uh, or certainly to maintain that flow. If a VFD is tied in with the flow meter on the return line, and that pump is you know, calculated, tuned correctly, then that VFD is gonna make sure that that pump is maintaining that flow at any time during the day. Um, Cause you gotta, you gotta think of that, about it in these terms. You know, we, we go in, think of all the pump rooms you've been in and there's always a gear operated valve on the pump effluent. You're lying if you think anybody is going in there on an hourly basis and doing what I just said in regards to pump curves and confirming flow to ensure that they're maintaining their design rate. It, it doesn't happen. We set the pump and we let it run. But what happens is that filter is constantly getting dirty. So you're not maintaining that flow as soon as you turn it on. As soon as it starts recirculating water and collecting particulate dirt and debris, you're losing flow. But if this VFD is tied in with that flow meter and we tell it to maintain 500 GPM, then when that filter is clean, that pump will ramp down. Because the VFD is saying, whoa, too much power, we're good here. But as that filter gets dirty, that VFD is gonna go, come on, dude, pick it up a bit. You know, we need to maintain 500 and we're only at 350 here. Um, so VFD is very important. And if, a, if you take anything away, the importance of maintaining your design flow rate, because again, it's just, it's a snowball effect. Um, so ultimately, slower speeds with the pump equate to less energy usage. Um, it's beneficial for all pumps. You know, recirculation with flow meter is key because that filter gets dirty and cleaned. Uh, but with a feature or a slide, you know, that's continuous flow. But the VFD is still beneficial because of its slow ramp up speed. If you've got a 30, 40, 50 horsepower pump, whatever it is, even 20, even 15, your electrical company is charging you based on your peak demand. So when you start that pump up and it goes zero to 60 in a tenth of a second, your utility company is going, oh, look at all that money. We're charging them that. Whereas if you got a VFD and that thing can slow start over 15 to 30 seconds, now the electrical company doesn't see any peak demand. You're just paying what everybody else pays. Additionally, you can likely earn credits from you your utility company. I know here locally, I'm, I'm based out of Rhode Island. Uh, I don't know if it's still valid right now, but a short time ago it was you install a VFD, you run it for six months, they're gonna give you a $3,500 rebate pays for the unit. These things are not expensive. Um, they'll pay for them under a year regardless. So make sure you got a VFD. Uh, as far as filtration, preventive maintenance, sand filters, you know, monitor that pressure differential, that influent pressure and that effluent. As soon as it reaches 10 PSI greater than your startup pressure differential, we got a backwash. And we want to make sure it's in a, a sufficient backwash. Uh, when you go to backwash, you want to make sure you backwash all your tanks. You don't want one clean and one dirty. Um, you want to backwash typically three to seven minutes, I'll say. Um, five is probably about average. You want to make sure that that water coming out your sight glass on the waistline is clean. Because otherwise, if you go back to filtration prematurely, you're just compacting that dirt and debris down further and further into the bed. And over time, it's gonna solidify, almost turn to like concrete. So sufficient backwashes. Inspect your sand bed once a year. Make sure that you have spare gaskets, manway gaskets on hand. Get in there and scoop out. Well, first of all, see if there's any channeling or anything because you know channeling might lead to a, a, a jeopardized internal. 
uh, but scoop out some sand and inspect it. You know, it should be jagged. It shouldn't be round. You know, it's going to capture dirt and debris. If it's round, the dirt and debris is just going to flow through it. Um, maybe consider replacing just the top couple inches every year. Give it a, you know, little boost at the beginning of the year. Um, typically, sand needs to be replaced, I'd say, every seven to 10 years. Um, conduct a filter cleanse every year. Open up the manway, put in the appropriate amount of filter cleanse, fill it with water, let it sit, backwash it, follow the instructions. It's going to be beneficial. Uh, again, have replacement manway gaskets and also ensure your valves are working properly. I mean, those valves you're using on a much more frequent basis than your surge tank valves, but if you've been shut down, you know, check them out. Make sure everything's seating properly. On RMF filters, again, we want to mo uh, monitor the gauges, the influent effluent. You change the median when it reaches 10 PSI greater than the startup, just like stand. Uh, but we can also look through the filter and vis visually inspect it. You know, I have some installations that have um, high iron content in the water. So um, they'll, they'll notice, you know, fouling on the perlite media before the pressure differential reaches that 10 PSI, but they want to change the media because they find that it protects the equipment downstream, exchangers, UV, et cetera. Um, flexible tube wash, you're going to do that at least once a year. Um, you know, an indoor heavy use facility might do it quarterly, um, but it's just, you know, going in there with a hose and washing the flex tubes down. Uh, and then again, at least once a year doing a filter cleanse, just like the sand filter vacuum it in, fill the tank, let it sit, drain it out. Um, and again, make sure, inspect all your, your actuators and your fittings and your tubing. Uh, make sure everything is uh, in good condition. Ultraviolet, secondary disinfection. Um, it should be installed within a bypass loop. Uh, routine maintenance includes cleaning the quartz sleeve components uh, that goes around the UV lamp. Uh, potentially replacing lamps if, if they've expired and seals when they've degraded. Um, in, in, uh, excuse me, inspect and replace the sacrificial anode if the unit has one. Um, and being proactive on this service will ensure the best performance. Uh, particularly with the UV unit, you just don't want a bright light in a tube, right? We want to make sure that it's doing what it's supposed to do, which is 40 millijoules to combat crypto and 60 millijoules to combat um, combined chlorines, chloramines, excuse me. And we'll go into that in a moment here. So the importance of preventative maintenance, identifying the issues early can save us time and costs in the long run. Um, you know, I think about my house all the time. You know, it's just like, you know, whether you rent an apartment, rent a house, own a house, whatever, you start to see that paint peel and it's like, you know, if I just went and got a brush and just touched up that area, I probably won't have to repaint the whole house in two years. Um, you know, so that snowball effect, it just builds and builds and builds. And I, I recently saw this picture and one of my colleagues used uh, in a presentation. And I mean, it just says it all. You know, this was just a minor cracked flange that could have easily been, you know, fixed potentially by even somebody on site, but they let it fester and it just turns into uh, something bigger. And uh, I, I think just uh, before I go on, have a qualified person repair and replace fail components, you know, but, but if, you, if you're doing your preventative maintenance, you know, it, it, it will come to that less frequently. Um, you know, if we're tightening bolts when we notice them coming loose, you know, opposed to letting them go on, you know, they won't, get so bad that you need to call a professional in at 3 a.m. because something burst. Uh, so some safe and sustainable solutions that are available today. This first one, you know, it's, it's not really my forte, but I've seen it. I think it's pretty cool. Um, it's a portable ozone water system. You literally plug, you know, hook up a garden hose to it and the machine generates ozone to disinfect anything that can be wet. So decks, stocks, pool equipment, toys, showers, locker rooms. I mean, you know, if a facility has outdoor playgrounds, anything that can get wet. Um, so very safe option for sanitizing surfaces um, 
with ozone. RMF filtration, you know, it's, it's the best filtration available on the market today, uh, providing superior water quality, but also uh, reducing operating costs and, and being sustainable at the same time, um, saving water and, and footprint, carbon footprint. Um, how it works, it's surface filtration versus depth. There's these flex tubes that perlite media or DE, you can use diatomaceous earth, but it's a carcinogen and you can't dispose of diatomaceous earth to waste. Perlite, you can't. So it's just, you know, they both work, uh, but perlite's a little bit easier to handle and, and discharge. Um, we want to regenerate every day for optimal performance. Regenerating is bumping, reducing. Actually, I'll go over it here in a moment. Um, and RMF filters down to one particle, whereas sand is um, one micron, excuse me, particle removal, where sand is 20 to 30 microns. Uh, you know, sand gets better as it gets dirty, uh, but the human eye can see about 30 microns. So sand is removing what the human eye can see. RMF is, is going a step further. Um, power bump system um, is new technology, temporarily reverses the flow to dislodge the media. Um, delivering 25 times, 25% um, more water through the tubes at 40% stronger impulse to release that uh, in the regeneration process, which we'll touch on here in a moment. Um, so to give you an idea of, of micron size, you can see the scale to the right here where a paper clip is about 1,000 microns, human hair is about 50, 100 microns, or pollen at about 30 to 50 microns. So RMF has the ability to filter down to one micron, essentially red blood cells. Uh, cryptosporidium is about, well, you can see there on the lower left, it's about four and a half to five and a half micron size. And this chart on the left is, um, is, by, is from the University of North Carolina, Charlotte, Dr. Ambergie. Um, the sand is, is a little bit older, um, a couple of years old, but you know, it, was, it was tested and um, proven uh, that sand removes 28%, to be exact, I believe it was 28.3% of five micron size particles. Whereas the RMF removed, here it's listed at 90, but it's in fact 99.7% five micron size in a single turnover, single pass. So substantial, um, the difference is clear. Uh, these are some pictures we just had done in the last couple of weeks uh, where this is a facility where this is their two indoor pools, pool on the left and a pool on the right. Uh, they already have RMF technology on their two outdoor pools. Um, we just did it on the pool on the right. And you can see the difference. You know, we've got some targets there in the center of the screen, um, you know, 15 foot from the pool wall, um, you know, the pool to the right from the pool to the left. Um, you know, the patrons at this club are actually asking, what, what's wrong with this pool? And it's like, well, nothing really. It's it's just we've improved this one and getting ready to do that one. So um, the difference is clear. So how, how are the operational costs recognized? Um, with traditional sand, you know, we're backwashing, we're reversing the flow, we're fluidizing that bed, and we're sending it to waste. Uh, the pump's running. We're doing it for three to seven minutes. Um, so a lot of volume of water. Where RMF technology, we're, we're gonna regenerate every day. Um, that perlite attaches to these flex tubes, but we're either gonna pneumatically bump it off or power bump it off. And if you think of my fist as one particle of perlite media, 85% of it is open void space, just waiting to collect dirt and debris. So when we bump it, we're turning the pancake over to cook the other side. That's, that's my COVID meme, or meme, meme. That's what it is. I gotta keep, my kids gotta keep reminding me of that. Um, this is my COVID do. I've got my first vaccine shot. Second one coming up in two weeks. Two weeks after that, I'm fully vaccinated. This guy could have a haircut in a month from now. Whew, believe it. So the importance, so sorry to digress. RMF filtration, when you bump every day, you're extending that filter cycle. 
you're redistributing that perlite media so that we can saturate it and take advantage of all its open area to collect dirt and debris. No water is discharged to waste. We're not gonna send any water to waste until that pressure differential reaches 10 PSI from our startup differential. So when we don't have to send water to waste every day, every other day, every week, every other week, you know, that could, you know, relate to up to 90% reduction in water to waste, up to 90% reduction in makeup water, uh, which could relate to 50% in electrical savings. And I'll point out those electrical savings are twofold. One, you know, we're using a VFD, you know, and the benefit here with the RMF is that we build pressure at the day during the day, but then we bump and it comes back down and we continue to do that. Where a sand filter, you start it up, it only gets dirty. So it's that up down where we're saving a lot of electrical with the RMF. Additionally, it's surface filtration instead of depth. So there's less head restriction, about 10 feet less head. Um, and you know, obviously it's the less water we need to retreat and reheat. Um, I'll offer this to anybody on the call. We, we do do a free def, um, RMF cost savings analysis where um, you can provide us you know, your flow rate. If, if you have your, your, your utility costs, you know, water per thousand gallons, sewer per thousand gallons, cost for, per therm to reheat the water, your electrical cost per kilowatt hour. If it's a renovation, tell us how often you're backwashing. These are conservative, I'll tell you that. I mean, I've been doing the RMF since 2003, and I've had many a customers call me back and say, Scott, you are by far conservative. So I like to hear that. Um, here's a little bit more on this, you know, the new power bump. Um, it's currently for, for smaller pools, which I think will apply to a lot of people on the call here, you know, up to 300 gallons a minute, fitting through standard doors. It's non-metallic, it's fiberglass, no moving parts, um, fully automatic. So you're gonna get that traditional RMF technology and quality, but in an affordable package. So encourage anybody to reach out to me if they, they, they'd like to hear more. Uh, here's a little bit more about, um, can you guys see that on my screen? <laughs> I'm sorry, I have an incoming call coming. No worries, yeah, you can just click out of it. <laughs> uh, it's just concerning because it's my wife. My phone's blowing up. <laughs> um, come on, get out of here. All right, so power bump system. Um, the difference between pneumatic bump, um, it, it's we're using the pump, we're reversing the flow. So it's resulting in 25 times more power um, and 40% more impulse to remove that perlite you know in traditional bump systems the bump comes down the water comes up to the top it flows reverse through the tubes and it expels the uh the media um so it, it comes off in cakes almost so it's about 10 motions and then we get a solution whereas this power bump takes place for 40 seconds and it's just immediate dispersion uh, and then goes back into a pre-coat to flip those pancakes and cook the other side. All right. So UV light generators, um, two types. There's low pressure and medium pressure. And the two primary functions are disinfection and chloramine reduction. Um, and it is secondary disinfection. You know, you can't test for UV light in your pool side. So you do need um, traditional chemical um, disinfection, whether it's liquid chlorine, Cal Hypo, whatever it might be, uh, to maintain residual in your pool. Um, the two types, again, are low and medium. Uh, the differentiator there is the pressure of the mercury gas inside the UV lamp uh, that determines the wavelength that's being produced. With low pressure, we're getting one monochromatic 250 nanometer energy wave. It's breaking down are monochloramines only. Whereas medium pressure is polychromatic, it emits energy across the UVC spe spectrum, um, 
demonstrates higher germicidal disinfection efficiencies, but it's breaking down all three chloramine species. So we're, we're taking care of the crypto and the combined, um, whereas the, the low pressure is focused more on the disinfection aspect instead of the chloramine reduction. How it works is, uh, you know, the water flows through the chamber and the light inactivates the DNA or the RNA. Um, it renders the, the cell useless. It, it basically sterilizes it. Um, you know, if it can't reproduce, it's gonna die off very quickly. Um, the performance is dependent on the transmit, transmittance, and that's referred to as the UVT, where we actually measure the level that light can penetrate your water stream. So pools are considered typically 95% UVT, whereas drinking water is closer to 98% UVT or above. You know, we all acknowledge a swimming pool is not as good as the water that comes out of our tap, or at least shouldn't be. Um, so it's very important that we size these UVs to be able to combat what our pool conditions are. So water clarity affects the transmittance, water filtration affects clarity. We see how everything's connected here. So UV light, as far as disinfection is concerned, it complements the primary program, that be it the liquid or the cow hypo. Um, it's gonna reduce the amount that's needed because again, it's just residual. It's not gonna have to be, we're gonna get more bang for our buck. The chlorine's not gonna have to be combating the organics in the water because the UV is taking care of it as it flows through. Um, so again, we're gonna in, inactivate bacteria, viruses, protozoa, um, including the chlorine resist, resistant cryptosporidium. So how do we do, or what is chloramine reduction? Um, you know, we're improving that air quality. You know, everybody knows that, everybody can relate walking into a hotel room and says, oh, where's the pool? You know, I can smell my way. Um, you know, the, the UV, medium pressure that is, is gonna break down these organic compounds that uh, what are referred to as the DBPs, the disinfection byproducts. Um, and only medium pressure is capable of taking um, care of um, the dyes and the tries. Uh, the low pressure, again, is only going to handle the mono. So what are DBPs, disinfection byproducts? Well, when chlorine reacts with organic compounds, oil, sweat, urine, it happens, um, it forms DBPs. And this, this off gases into, you know, into off the pool. And it's, it's what causes the burning eyes, the smell we, we smell, um, it's bad for swimmers, um, you know, swimmers asthma, swimmers lung, whatever you want to call it. Um, so it, it really can affect swimmers' performance and long-term health. Um, and these gases just dissipate into an auditorium. If you've got an indoor pool, they just they 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 rest on you know they land on your your steel door frames, your your light switch covers, or uh, right there on your right your deck equipment. Um, and it's, it's going to start to corrode the metals. Um, otherwise, you're going to have to continuously, another preventative maintenance, you know, is wash the stainless steel down to make sure that they're not settling and drying out and, you know, starting to cause corrosion. So what are some important considerations when selecting a UV generator? Again, going back to the UV, we want to make sure the UV is designed to do what you want it to do. Uh, the model aquatic health code by the CDC, um, rapidly being adopted by many states, um, actually touches on this, that if you have a system that was designed at 98% efficiency, or UVT, or a system that was designed at 94% UVT, and the pool is in fact 95% UVT, then your performance could be affected 30% by going with that unit that was not designed appropriately. Uh, so very important. Um, 
and it also very important to get have an intensity and a dose readout. We want to make sure, I think I mentioned it before, we want to make sure it's, you know, if this is outdoor, we want to make sure it's 40 crypto. We want to make sure it's 60 indoors, combating those, you know, chloramines. So we want we we want to ensure that it's not just a bright lamp in a in a tube. Um, dose pacing, um, it's that'll extend the life of the lamp. But, you know, when we have a new lamp, we don't want it to run 100 percent. You know, just burn it out quicker. Uh, so you start it uh, very low, and then you just ramp it up as the lamp dies, and it'll extend the life of the the lamps. And we're seeing that today. I mean, lamps are or less than well over a year when, you know, initially it was, you know, oh, you're lucky if you get a year, um, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Nice to have an automatic wiper, not nice, essential. You know, there's fouling that takes place on that quartz sleeve. It's gonna affect the UVT. If that quartz sleeve is, is contaminated, then the UV lamp is not gonna penetrate the water and do what it's supposed to do. So we wanna make sure that quartz sleeve has a, has a wiper that goes up and down it uh, typically, it's scheduled to go up and down it based on your turnover. So if you've got a six-hour turnover, every six hours it's going. If you've got a spa with a 15-minute turnover, every 15 minutes it's going up and down. Um, it's also nice on newer UV units. Um, there's wipers for the sensors that is, you know, reading that intensity. So we don't want that sensor to get fouled either. Most importantly, we want to make sure it's third-party validated. I'm a manufacturer. I'm a salesperson. I can be as honest as the day long, which I am, but it's a lot more comforting when you have a third-party agency that's testing. And I'm not talking NSF. Everything should be NSF listed at minimum. But third-party is a, is a testing agency that is validating that this UV is going to do what we say it's going to do. Um, so very important. And also what's very important is local service and support. This is admittedly a unit that's going to require service and support. You want to make sure that it's running as it should. Um, so it's important to have um, somebody that can come in and change the quartz sleeve or change the wiper blades, um, et cetera. With that, I thank you for your time. I welcome any questions. And uh, again, thank you been fun yeah. thanks scott um some great information there and we do have a few questions here um first of all oscar is asking uh, if your dehumidifier system has any leaks uh how do you resolve that yeah i don't get into dehumidification but if he okay. wants to um yeah if yeah it certainly i mean dehumidification is key too you know air sure. handling within your natatorium but I don't get into the HVAC, unfortunately, or okay. maybe fortunate, I don't know. But sorry, I'd throw that out there. No, I'd no be worries. happy to, you know, if you want to give me a call later, um, you know, my number and email is on the screen. I would be happy to, um, you know, to, to recommend you to some people that, you know, I know from the industry that I know will take care of you. Nice. Um, so why install a UV on an outdoor pool if it's not a kid's pool and there's no concern of crypto? Good question. I've actually, ironically, I've, I've had this question probably two or three times this week. Um, and it's a good question and I recommend it. Um, you know, the model aquatic health code recommends uh, UV on any pools with swimmers five years and younger for obvious reasons. But even if it's a competitive lap, whatever it is, pool, outdoors, you want to still combat those chloramines regardless that they're being released to atmosphere you know it's not yes it's not an indoor pool you don't need to be worried about corrosion etc but you still need to be concerned about the swimmer's health uh, health um, so these gases are very heavy stay at the water surface so as those swimmers are breathing they're inhaling that so i believe that uv is just important on an outdoor competitive pool as it is an indoor competitive pool um, and further, it's absolutely, you know, recommended if, if the pools are geared for five and younger. Um, so I, I think UV is, is a no brainer, honestly. I mean, in the scheme of things on, on project costs, it's, it's pretty insignificant. And at minimum, you should plumb in a bypass. If you're doing a new build now, or even a renovation, you want to hold off on the UV, 
while they got it ripped apart, at least put the bypass in so you can come back in later and, and add UV. Sure, sure. Um, I know you talked a little bit about this, but maybe you could do a little bit more of a clarification on when you sh when you should be servicing your equipment and when maybe to call a professional service company. Yeah. Um, so if if we do preventive maintenance, I mean, if you know your system, I tell everybody when they first get a system, it's like you don't know it yet, but you're you're going to become very friendly with it, and you're going to know when it doesn't feel well. If you maintain that, just don't don't take the mentality or I'll do that, you know, next shutdown. You know, take care of things as they come about because if you notice, you know, a loose bolt, for example, on a flange, if you tighten that, that's easy enough. You don't need to call a professional in for that. But if it leads to the pipe, you know, leaking and calcifying, you know, now and potentially a, a flange replacement, you know, now you got to call a professional in. And it was simply because you didn't do something easy at the beginning, right? A lot of people, you could even look at it in terms of, you know, doing a media inspection on your sand filters. All too many of us set it and forget it. I'll see you in 10 years. But if you did that inspection, like I reviewed earlier, you might go 12 or 14 years, you know? So yeah. I'd say you'd be lucky to go 10 years if you don't inspect it every year, you know? Sure. So it's, it's just continuous preventive maintenance, everything. Sure. And you know what? I learned something this week, variable frequency drives preventative maintenance you got to go in there and make sure that those terminal strips don't come loose over time <laughs> so you know i had one just this week that shorted out because a terminal strip came loose over time and <laughs> you know i read in the o and m sure enough it says you know make sure belts yeah. you know, regularly yeah. check yeah. you know yeah. so some common sense and then if you do have a bigger problem definitely call a service professional yeah i don't recommend people maintaining their uv those lamps mm -hmm. are expensive. If it breaks, let the service guy pay for it, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, right? Yeah, um, right. There, there are some things, you know, I think one thing anybody that has children that we've learned in this pandemic is how valuable teachers are because I'm not very good at third, seventh, eighth, and ninth grade right now, but I'm doing <laughs> it, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it to the teachers in the future. I'm not going to say that I can do it better than them. Um, <laughs> sure. they, they got it. You right. know? So stick to what you do. Right. Uh, to that end, uh, you know, do you guys or other, other manufacturers in the industry offer preventative maintenance packages um, for the equipment? Yeah, there's um, that's some, some designers out there actually put in their bid that, you know, we want a preventative maintenance visit at six months, 12 months, 18 months, 24 months, whatever it might be. Uh, but again, it's, it, there's, I would bet that there's going to be preventative maintenance in your O&M manual. So, you know, O&M manuals are awful. They're, you know, because they're just so comprehensive. You know, maybe take the time and just take the preventative maintenance sections out of each and start your own little book that's for your facility of preventative maintenance section. So you don't need to go back to every operating manual that you have. Sure. Um, what we do as a manufacturer, we, we try to incentivize um, end users, owners, when they buy one of our UV systems, we try to encourage them to do a service agreement with our area representation. And we do that by extending the warranty, traditional one-year warranty to a five-year warranty. You know, so we'll, if you have, you know, one of our factory certified people come out there twice a year, make sure everything's kosher, I'm going to extend the warranty from one year to five years. I mean, that just shows Fair. how important preventive maintenance is, right? I mean, that's sure. that's substantial. Yeah, yeah. Um, Catherine is asking, one critique she's heard of UV is that it deteriorates chlorine as all UV light does. Is there a measurable loss of chlorine when using UV as a secondary sanitizer? It, not if it's sized appropriately. That's a, it, it's very valid, um, but it should not be an issue, um, you know, if it's sized appropriately. We don't want to oversize it, but we also want to make sure that it's sized appropriately. And, you know, I wouldn't say that it's, you're not going to burn off any, but I don't think it's, it shouldn't be substantial. Uh, sure. You know, again, the, the chlorine is, the disinfection is is distributed after the UV and, you know, it goes into the pool. By the time that water is going through the mechanical system again, you know, what what levels are, are left there to, 
you know, to burn yeah. through, you know, I mean, it's, yeah. it's just, it's a fine balance. And I, and I always balance on this question because there are certain parts of the country that have some um, stringent sizing requirements and, and it leads to just burning through chlorine. I mean, it's like, yeah. you know, how can you size something that much? I mean, you're, you're just going to be, you're wasting money. Yeah. Yeah. Know, by oversizing it. Sure. Um, all right. I think that takes care of our questions today. Uh, Scott, I don't know if you have anything else uh, to add. No, appreciate it. I'm available. Um, sorry if I don't get back to you right away. I try to, um, you know, but I, I love the, I love talking to everybody after these webinars and trying to help them out on their, you know, unique little situation. And if I don't know, I, I probably have a friend somewhere out there um, that can help us. All right. Well, I think your wife is going to be uh, looking for a call back here pretty soon. Yeah, I don't know. I, I got one. I got one son and a wife that are blowing up the cell phone right now. So <laughs> I'm somebody's sure the in trouble. isn't working right at home. So. Somebody wants to give me their side of the story first. All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, thank you to everybody for joining us today on behalf of Athletic Business and our sponsor, Neptune Benson. Scott, thank you so much for uh, the great presentation and all the information. Andy, thank you very much. And hey, I look forward to seeing you guys all in person in October, right? Absolutely, at AB Show and at San Antonio. Hope to see awesome. everybody on the, online as well. So thanks again. Absolutely. Thanks, Have guys. A Have a great one.